I was pretty much self-taught. And any time that I needed to really like learn something, I would find a salon and go sit in the salon in the waiting area, just watch stylists. You know what I mean? How do you land Michelle Obama as a client? What's up, guys? I am Johnny Wright. I am a celebrity hairstylist and author and motivational speaker. And you are tuned in to Swap Sessions. Um, when did you decide that hair was going to be your, your thing? Um, very early on, actually, I, um, you know, my grandmother was a hairstylist, my grandmother, Minnie Brown, my grandmother started doing hair when she was 13. She did hair until she was 91 years old and she passed oh, wow. when she was 93. Um, but my grandmother noticed that my interest in hair very early on at the age of two, she said I was combing her hair into a clean ponytail at the age of two years old. So. The, the interest was always there. Um, not just my grandmother did hair. My grandfather also did hair. My uncles did hair. My uncle owned salons in Chicago. My, my grandmother owned salons. So it's just, it's in our family blood, um, the, the whole hairstyle yeah. is a big world thing. But um, it wasn't until the age of like nine, 10, I started dreaming about doing hair and having dreams about hairstyles. And I, I just had this, innate knowledge on how to create a style. I don't, you know, it's just, I had it. But I kind of fought it for a long time because, you know, I grew up in church. I was very, you know, in a religious family and I was worried about people thinking that I was gay. Although I was, I wasn't open to that at that age, you know, being in the, you know, in the city of Chicago, living, growing up on the south side of Chicago, having gangs around and all that kind of stuff. You just wanted to try to protect yourself. So, it just wasn't yeah. something that I thought I could do. And then around the age of 11, um, a lady by the name of Carol Carolyn used to do my mom's hair. And she was this very, you know, effervescent personality, you know, type of girl that does your relaxer and has a cigarette in her mouth at the same time. And I just <laughs> loved watching Carolyn do my mom's raps. Uh, Cause my grandmother did my mom's hair up until that moment, but she's she was doing raps and stuff like that. That's when the raps kind of became a popular thing. You used to rap with a lot of body and put you on the dryer and, and all that kind of stuff. And I used to love watching her do it. And I said to Carolyn one day, I said, I, I want to do hair. And she was like, well, why won't you? I said, well, I don't want nobody to think that I'm gay. And she said, oh boy, please. She said, you'll be gay with fat pockets. And I, I, <laughs> and I know that sounds so like small, but that was the aha moment for me at 10 or 11 years yeah. old. Just that, I think it just kind of like uh, activated this idea that people's thoughts of you don't matter, you know? Right. And I right. remember being, my insecurity was crippling to the point where I was afraid to walk in a crowded room and things like that. And um, that moment was a defining moment for me to say, you know what? I'm going to live naturally. I'm going to be myself. I'm going to do, do my thing. And, you know, I can literally pinpoint the moments behind the chair that has grown me into the man that I am now in my comfort space, in my freedom, being exactly, mm -hmm. showing up exactly who I am, being comfortable in my skin. So I dedicate my whole life to my career just based on, you know, being able to really build my confidence behind the chair. And this has been a lovely experience so far. <laughs> yeah. And I think that it, I think it's amazing when you, you can find something that you're passionate about at such a young age and yeah. then have people in your life that not just know that, but motivate you into stepping into that space. Yeah. So, see, I had, I had supportive parents cause you know, my mom was raised by a hairstylist. So, and my dad of course was understood that it could be very lucrative. My, my, my dad built a salon for me in the basement of our South Side Chicago home when I was 13 years old. So I had a full wow. clientele by the age of 12. I did my, my mother's friends, the church family, the people in my neighborhood, classmates. When I got into high school, I was doing all my teacher's hair. It was just crazy. And so I, I started my business savvy very early on. And I think that's where I've been able to kind of pay the dues throughout the year to get me to where I am yeah. now. And 
So <laughs> start early. <laughs> so I'm not I'm not going to age you, but I'm 46. <laughs> you're okay. So you were like finger waves and like the uh, buns and crimp and all you that. Know, you know, like exactly. you were. Yes, you got it. No, oh I, my mom. Please. My mom was my, a hairstylist. <laughs> my first, my first, uh, it's so much noise going on by here. Of course, today is in New York. No. But my, my first, um, it's New York. <laughs> I know, it's just like all of a sudden today. My first hairstyle <laughs> I did was a French roll. Uh, it was a French roll. I did a French roll on my mom. My mom was my first client, of course. I did a French roll yeah. on her, and I, um, I stuffed it with toilet tissue. But the reason yeah. why that's so important <laughs> is because you couldn't see the toilet tissue. I was able to make it such a clean comb to it that you could see the toilet tissue inside. So yeah, I started doing updos was my thing. I was doing updos, the ponytails, um, and then got into finger waves. Then I started getting into really, really short haircuts. I was doing short haircuts a lot. So yeah, it it, it, it all started with the updos and finger waves and all that kind of stuff. The, yeah. the, the um the waterfall ponytails and all that kind of stuff. I've done all that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was an era. And yeah, you had to yeah. you had to know what you were doing, or you was going to jack somebody's hair up. And yeah, if you jack somebody's hair up on a Friday, a very detailed. And I was a perfectionist. Yeah. So I used to spend a couple of hours on somebody's head, but you know I wanted to make sure it was right. So, <laughs> so when you when did you truly know that you had a gift in, in doing hair? When did you know that was your gift? Uh, I think around that age, around eleven, twelve. I remember. Uh, uh, a client by the name of Tina. I can't. I think her last name was Tina Johnson. Like anyway, Tina. She was a um. She her brother was a pastor. She you know was active in his church, and she used to come get her hair done every like week to get her hair done. And she said to me, "I just love the fact that I could tell people a twelve year old is doing my hair, and they're always <laughs> so shocked by that." And I knew then that it, there was some type of gift. There and and I, I honestly yeah. knew it was because I didn't have proper trainings per se. Yes, I used to sit and watch my grandmother do hair, but my grandmother was a press and girl, press and curl type of girl. You know what I mean? And I didn't really right. do that. I started doing relaxers and you know blowouts and things like that. So I was pretty much self taught. And any time that I needed to really like learn something, I would find a salon and go sit in the salon in the waiting area, just watch stylists. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> but um, I was self-taught, so I knew it was a gift then, um, very early on. And I think I even recognized the, to, to label it as a gift at that, at that age. Yeah. Yeah. When you, when you grow and like now you're, you're outside of the, the 20 year old area, or you're going into the year old area rather, um, you're leaving school. What do you do after high school? Do you go straight? into salon do you go and get a license or do you go to college how does that work so what happened was m the plan was to take cosmetology in high school um and so okay. i was doing i started doing hair i think around seventh eighth grade right so the, the mm -hmm. plan was to take cosmetology school uh cosmetology courses when i got to high school and i went to percy l julian on the south side of chicago and what happened is is you can't take it as a freshman so mm -hmm. i did my freshman year but by the time I turned a sophomore, they took it out. They took the program out of the, the school. So I was like, okay, we won't okay. be doing that. I'm about to wait to after. So basically, I just continued to do hair. Like I told you, my father built a salon for me in the basement. One summer, I think around 14, I just wanted to see what it was like to work in a salon. So I went to this salon called T's and D's, a beauty salon, which was Tyrone and Donna. And it was drug dealers, and they owned a the salon in, in the south side of Chicago. <laughs> Uh, in, in the Rosen area, and I worked in that salon, and I worked there the whole summer, and that's, I think that's when my father was like, you don't need to be paying them no boots, right? I'm gonna build you a salon in the basement. And I came back, so I pretty much just worked illegally yeah. for all those years, uh, and doing hair <laughs> in my, my parents' basement. And then when I graduated from high school, now it has a name to it. I didn't think it had a name to it back then, but I took a gap year, basically, where I just focused on okay. doing hair. Um, so I didn't go to beauty, beauty college right away. I just focused on doing hair for a year, year and a half. And then I went to Delhi Beauty College. And that's when I got my, my license there. And honestly, I was, I, was, I was happy to do that because that's when things really started to change in my career. Because prior to um, going to beauty school, you know, my thought process, I'm going to own salons, you know, I'm going to run salons and I'm going to do that. 
But then when I got to beauty school and I got introduced to the freelance world and working on set and session styling and things like that, I mm -hmm. decided I didn't want to go on a journey of opening this salon anymore. I wanted to work with celebrities and work in film and television. And that's where it kind of changed to the clientele that I have now. So it was, you know, it was a, gotcha. it was a blessing to be able to go to uh, beauty school. And the, 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 the director of education, Betty Clausen, who I just visited at my tour stop in Chicago a couple weeks ago, you know, she knew about me from the grapevine. She was like, who's this young kid doing everybody's hair? He's illegal. He can come in and get his license. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I, I went in and she was like, listen, I know you know how to do hair already. You just kind of come get your license, your, your theory, and you got to come, you know, get certified. So she, she kind of pushed me along. And, um, you know, I was supposed to finish in, I think, two years I ended up finishing a year because she would have me do hair competitions and things like that, like with the beauty, like with the beauty shows that were coming to the area. And I would win those competitions and she would just give me extra hours based on that. So all that kind of helped me. And I would actually do like helping teach the kids on like technique and stuff like that because I had already had yeah. it because I've been doing it for so long. So she'd give me extra hours that way. I don't know how legal it was for her to do that, but I thank God I only had to do nine months of school <laughs> instead of 18 months. <laughs> instead of 18, you got it, you got it done. When you when you step out and now it's like you're you're working on in entertainment, you're working on sets, you're working with celebrities. Is there a is there a point where you're like, I can I can now be loud and proud about what it is that I do? Was it, did that happen before that moment? Yeah, yeah. Or did that, happen that, all happened, that, that all happened once I started doing hair. Um, I was always celebrated, you know, and that's, that's excellent for a young, undeveloped mind and undeve undeveloped emotions and stuff. So, you know, I was always a little more mature than my brothers, <laughs> so to speak, you know, I was the youngest. Mm -hmm. But um, 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 that kind of happened then. I mean, you know, you, you think about, you know, me being in high school and I'm doing, 50% of, of the girls at school. I'm doing my teachers at school. So my confidence was pretty, you know, I, I wouldn't say egotistical, but my confidence was pretty much over the roof as far as like knowing that I had a talent. So me yeah. starting to live out loud in that space was very early on. Now, as far as my sexuality is concerned, that happened a little later on, of course, but I never really came out. I just, I just started letting people in, so to speak. I yeah. like how you put that. Yeah. I, like I don't really that. believe in coming out. I just feel like, you know, this is who I am. And I, I don't think too many people were surprised anyway. <laughs> I have <laughs> I have a friend that said, I didn't come out. I started letting you mind my business. Yeah. And exactly. I was like, I, I was like, that's, that's real slick. I like that. Yeah. So you, you transform um, into... Okay, so you get you you develop your career. You are you're doing amazing. You end up in the most probably, in my opinion, the most exclusive hairstylist job <laughs> in the probably in the world. Uh, is how do you how do you land Michelle Obama as a client? Okay, so for eight years. So remember, I told you that you know I started wanting to do freelance work, more freelance work when I went to hair school. What, yeah. what where that moment came in was um, Betty Clausen, the education director at, at WB College, um, got approached by, I think, Bud or Miller Junior Draft. You know, you used to, back in the day, they had the, the Bud girls, the Miller girls. And yeah. they were doing a new uh, campaign. And they contacted the school to see if they can send stylists to volunteer for the shoot. Prior to this, I had never worked on a photo shoot before, never knew what a photo shoot was. So she recommended that I go. Packed all my tools, went downtown to the studio, and at this shoot, the makeup artist was this guy by the name of Landis Johnson. And Landis was a makeup artist in Chicago. He did a lot of celebrities in Chicago and, um, I worked this shoot, had an amazing time, loved the whole process of it. And Landis became my mentor. He became my mentor. Mm. And it was a perfect marriage because he was makeup and I was hair. So 
because he was already doing Chicago, the, the, uh, Chicago based celebrities and celebrities that came through Chicago, I was able to start mm -hmm. working with those celebrities. And so, um, my very first first lady is, of course, Lisa Ray McCoy. She was my first first lady. I was working with her for many, many years okay. and also was in Turks and Caicos with her when she was the first lady of Turks and Caicos. Um, but another thing that happened during my time with Landis, um, there was this commercial that was being shot in, in Chicago of, for American Family Insurance. And he recommended me to be the hairstylist for it. That commercial was booked through an agency, and the agency is called Ken Barboza, who is still an agency to this day. And Ken Barboza, I know, I know who, I know who yeah. that is. So yeah. Ken Barboza, I worked on, you know, he booked me through his agency, and since I, because I did such a good job, he was like, everybody loved you. I'm gonna add you to my roster as one of my my talents. So then that's when I got mm -hmm. my first agency was with, with through Kim Barboza. First and only hair and makeup agency was only Kim Barboza. I just I just parted ways with Kim Barboza maybe three years ago. And just because I just mm -hmm. felt like I, you know, I'm not in that space of like needing it anymore. But but that's how long I was with Kim Barboza. So in in 2007, this was maybe two weeks after the first family announced that they were running for president on Oprah. I got a call mm -hmm. from Ken, and he said, hey, I want to know if you can do the this, this senator's wife by the name of Michelle Obama. They're running for office, but if you could do her for this, for Essence Magazine photo shoot. I said, sure. It was on a Monday. I didn't work on Mondays. It was perfect. When did it? Not like it paid a lot of money because you get editorial weight, at rate. I think it was like 150 175 or something. It was really cheap, right? Back then. Right, right. And not even looking at this as an opportunity. I was just like, I was off. Yeah, I'll go make a couple of dollars. So I went and did her. Did her hair for Essence a photo shoot. We hit it off. She loved her hair. And then her staff reached out to me again to do it for O Magazine. And But by that time, I decided to move to L.A. to have more, more of a career in film and television. And so I did it for the shoot. And I was like, hey, I'm actually moving to LA. Good luck. I hope you guys win. Not thinking that anything was going to come out of it. <laughs> you know, we had never seen a black person yeah. in the White House. So I didn't think anything of it. I was just going to go chase my dreams and work in film and television. Moved to LA that August. Um, and that was in August 2000. I remember the exact date August 26, 2017. It was on a Sunday. I moved to LA. Started working in LA, started working for Frederick Vakai. There was the number one salon in the country at the time. They had celebrity clients that came in. They would send me on red carpet gigs and all that stuff. So the the campaign started getting more intense. And the first lady would be on the West Coast a lot. And every time she mm -hmm. would make it to LA, she would reach they, her staff would reach out to me and say, Hey, can you keep her get to come do the first lady for Ellen DeGeneres or Jay Leno or a, a, a fundraiser or a conference with all the campaign stuff that they were doing. So we, our relationship continued to grow. Then um, in 2008, when it's, they're about to, it's about to have the election, um, I get a call from our chief of staff asking me if I can come to Denver to be with her for the Democratic National Convention for the whole mm -hmm. week. And I was like, oh my God, I would love to. And at this point, it's like, it's seeming like it could be a thing, but you still not, you know, <laughs> sure, right? And so, right. so I go to Denver, I do her hair for the speech. Um, and that was the first time actually that I had did her hair from scratch. All the other times I like kept, kept her camera ready, pretty much touched up whatever her stylist did to her in the salon that week or whatever, right? So this is the first mm -hmm. time I did her from scratch and people noticed it. It was, they noticed the different stroke of the brush, so to speak, you know? Yeah. And I remember the next morning, a lot of people talk, everybody talked about her speech, but also everybody talked about her hair. I, I, I just remember, yeah. you know, the view, uh, Good Morning America, today's show, they all talked about her hair and they were trying to figure out who was doing it, <laughs> you know? And I remember mm -hmm. like, People trying to reach out to me and I couldn't really talk and all this kind of stuff. So anyway, the the DNC was later that year, and um, 
the uh, election was like two weeks later. And the election happened. Um, I, I think that was my first time voting. And I had an election, a, a, like election party at my house in LA. I had di- people over, dinner and everything. And they won. And we were all crying and celebrating and like taking shots and having a great time. And, you know, I remember one of my clients asked me, like, one of my friends asked me, like, do you think you're going to move to D.C.? So I was like, no, 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 no. Like, like of course, she's going <laughs> to take Ronnie with her, her, her stylist for, since she was 17 years old. And so right. didn't think anything of it. And then about three or four weeks after that, I get a call from her chief of staff and say, hey, Mrs. Obama would like you to come to D.C. to do her for the cover of Vogue. And I was like, oh my God, I get Vogue. You know, I'm like, I'm about to get Vogue, you know? And I go to do her, I, it, was, it was the 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 date of the shoot was on the 13th of January. And mm-hmm. I was set to arrive on the 12th. Now, mind you, the inauguration is gonna be on the 20th. So it was, it was very close to that. So I thought to myself, I'm because I was supposed to go on the 12th, do it on the 13th, leave on the 14th. But in my mm-hmm. mind, I said, let me pack my bags. I'm already in D.C. It's this historical moment. I'm going to pack my bags as if I'm going to go to this inauguration. Because I'm there. I could, I could try to figure this out, right? Never been yeah. to an inauguration before. Never wanted to be an inauguration before. And I, so I packed a big bag, and I went. So they put me up at the Hay Adams, which is also the place where they did the shoot. It was upstairs in the presidential suite. The Hay Adams was right across the street from the White House. Of course, I didn't know none of this stuff back then. I know it now. <laughs> uh, my focus wasn't politics. My focus was celebrities. You know what I mean? Um, right. So I, 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 to put me up the Hay Adams, the morning of the shoot happens. I go upstairs, set up. She walks in. She gives me a hug. I congratulate her and everything. And before she even sat down for me to start doing it for the shoot, she said, Johnny, I was wondering, would you be open to moving to DC to be my stylist? And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, totally <laughs> like blown away by this. And and I immediately said, yes, like, yeah, you know, <laughs> completely shocked. And then she said, great. She said, you know, Melissa will talk to you and talk to details and we'll figure out all that. And she said, also, are you able to stay here through inauguration? And I said, I actually packed my bags for it. <laughs> and so, so they put me up at the at the Hay Adams for that time and I stayed there. I didn't do it for the inauguration, but I did it for everything leading up to the inauguration. Ronnie actually came yeah. in to do it for the inauguration, but I did Barack's sisters, I did her mom, I did the girls and all that for the inauguration. And I was able to go to every ball of the inauguration because I was in the motorcade with them and it was amazing. Um, and all I can remember is saying to her, after I said yes, and I started doing the hair, and I was thinking to myself, like, how the hell am I going to do this? Like, you know, it's one thing that, like, when I moved from Chicago to L.A., I had a full clientele. I was, had a ton of money saved up. It was an easy change for me. But moving to L.A. and starting a brand new salon, even though it was the number one salon in the country, we were on salary, and the, the amount of money I was making wasn't the same as, like, my full clientele. So I'm like, I don't have, right. like, Twenty, thirty thousand dollars just sitting in my account, but I'm gonna figure this out. And I said to her, I right. said, "Listen, can you give me a month? Like, give me a month." She said, "Yeah, that month." She said, "Month is good. A month is good." And I moved to DC on Valentine's Day of 2009. It was a month and a day later when I moved to DC. Wow. And I was there for eight wow. years. That's how it all happened. You, <laughs> you were there for eight years, and is what's crazy is. From the outside looking in, like your your styling on her, every time we saw her it was it was so iconic, Aww. and it was like it's it's a that's the perfect style to go with this dress. That's the perfect look for this event. It's like we have this flawless person that's now in the White House, and you couldn't really talk trash about any of it. And yeah. we loved it. It was uh, like y'all gotta just sit and take all this. Yeah, I gotta eat and this. And it up. was just every every time it was like she's gonna come in here and kill it. And it's yeah. like you just you knew it was coming. And to know that you're the person behind those looks, and you say this is what you're wearing, this is where you're going. Let me do this. Yeah. And 
that that's a testament to to your talent to be able to pinpoint we're going to do a ponytail this day we're going to do a bob this day we're going to do like a long thing this day and never fail yeah you know what i mean I like that's, that. that's 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 a lot thank you thank you i yeah. i listen i i wanted to operate in excellence um i also realized you know once very early on after I got the offer that this was my service to the country as well. And making sure yeah. she was represented visually in that way was really important to me. And I also was rewarded in understanding that the way that her look evolved, her popularity evolved as well too. So my job was, I think, well received in that way. Um, Cause I always tell people, if you did a graph on how she looked and how her popularity grew based on how she looked. You would see that her popularity continued to grow, grow as her look evolved. And that's yeah. not to say that her look was bad or anything like that, but people don't want to listen to you unless they want to look at you first. And Absolutely. that's just the nature of the beast that we deal with, especially in the political world. And one thing I noticed the difference between celebrity and political world was you know, celebrity was all about new, now, next, and trend setting and all that, which I like, love, right? But the political mm -hmm. world was about a recognizable silhouette because that yes. also encouraged people to remember you when they went to the went to the, the the voting and vote because they may not have kept up with the with the campaign. But having a recognizable silhouette helps that. So that thought process for me when I did my research on that and other first ladies like that was really what I wanted to do just keeping her have some variation but keeping that that lux and that polishness all the way throughout the eight years I wanted to make sure that was you know it now for me I feel like I had some misses because that's just me being on top of myself but at the end of the day you know she oh, loved sir. it and that's all that mattered to me <laughs> yeah what what I what I know about again my mom having a salon for so many years is that a a stylish chair is three hours of therapy. Yeah. Like it's it's three hours of being able to just be in the moment. It's three hours of I have a a vulnerability barrier that's down to this person because I trust you. Yeah. And without getting into anything that's told to you. Did you ever have moments where it's like, I just want to protect you because oh, like you're getting, you're catching this from so many angles and I just want you to just. Absolutely. It was, relax you know, right they there. were under so much scrutiny and the American people were, you know, <laughs> some were very mean to her in particular. Um, and I, of course, saw it. I used to sit at the line at Safeway and get groceries and see the the tabloids and the horrible things it was saying and like and I'm sitting there like not just a bird's eye view, somebody that is literally there and I like know this is all false and everything. So that was always hard for me. So yeah, I did have that um protection feeling for her and the family per se. I mean, you know, yeah. that's why, you know, I I, you know, I was the one that tried to enhance her social life in some way and although you know at one point dc was like the 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 uh restaurant hub because a lot of people a lot of top chef it was a top chef restaurant hub a lot of top chefs will open up restaurants there and i think in one year mm -hmm. on 14th street like 28 restaurants opened up in one year and i will go to these restaurants and and the way these restaurants are set up they already know because it's a political city that they have a private room already built into the restaurant. Like I said, I would go check these restaurants out, check the food out, get the environment. I would like suggest suggest some, you know, Ms. Obama, like, let's go, let's go here and let's go to this spot, let's go to that spot. So that was always fun. And I used to always also, you know, have dinner at my house and have her over and I would hire a chef and I would cook and do things like yeah. that. And we used to have so much fun, but I just wanted her to feel normal. And I feel like that was a level yeah. of protection. Too. I just wanted to feel some sense of normalcy in our life for us to just kick back at the house and you like just having a little kickback and you're not in that world. And and we did it. We did it a, a several times and we had a you know a, a ball each time. So that was my level of protection. Even bringing the humor. You know, I'm I'm a I get my humor from my mom. I'm a very silly person, 
but I would just do silly things just to have her laughing. And to me, that's a way of protection as well, too. So, um, yeah. yeah, I did feel the need to protect her. And, you know, I, I remember sometimes that, you know, there would, there would be like horrible stories out about her. And I, I, I could just obviously tell that it affected her. And that really just like wore on me, too, because I, I just hated to see that. But she's a very strong woman. They're a very strong unit, her and Barack, and a very strong family. So, you know, she found her refuge in all of it. But at the same time, yes, to answer your question, I did feel the need to protect her. I feel like that with a lot of my clients, you know, especially if they in the yeah. eye of a lot of scrutiny. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, again, I just, I'm, I'm glad she had that outlet. Yeah. Um, I think that that was, I think that that was important in that moment because again, there was just a lot of vitriol coming towards that entire family. So yeah, was, I'm just, was, I'm glad was, that. Disgusting, disgusting. Yeah. I'm glad that you were, I'm glad you were in place to be able to give that refuge. Thank you. Um, talking about giving refuge, you have a 11 city tour. Yeah, happening right now, which is absolutely amazing. It's the Naturally You tour, based yeah. off of your book, which is Naturally and Curly, or Natural and Curly Hair for Dummies. Yes, yes. And we're in a space now where people are embracing their curls unapologetically. One thousand percent. So, what made you decide to do the tour? Let's start well, there. So, what made me decide to do the tour? So, I'll first talk about how, why why I, how I did the book. I mean, the book came through my agency um, and they was like, hey, we would like Johnny to author this title. And at the time it was called Natural Hair for Dummies. And I decided to ask them, can we change the name to Natural and Curly Hair for Dummies? Because I know there's a lot of people who have curly hair that don't consider it natural, like the Latino mm -hmm. dad community. We wanted to make sure that they knew this was for them as well too. And so right. we did that, I wrote the book, and in the process of writing the book and my like writing pattern, I would do like research to just make sure there was no, like to look for any nuances when it came to the subject and things like that, because I wanted to make sure that I had all that in as well too. It's like, it's impossible to have everything in the book, but I wanted to make sure I, 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 mm -hmm. I delivered as much information that I could and made it to break it down as simple as possible. People can really walk away with some knowledge. And in doing my process of researching, I used to, see these articles and all the articles will be so negative the way they started out talking about natural hair they say like it's frustrating i know it's hard and i know this and i just think to myself like jesus like what what does that feel like to just go to the google and just trying to find out some information about something that naturally grows out of your head and it starts off negatively right and mm -hmm. i think that that has to be traumatic then it made me think like I want to make sure that this book is a love letter to natural hair, a love letter to women who have curls, and talk about it in a very positive way. So I did that with the book, but then I started thinking further about like beauty standards and things that 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 all these isms and these phobias and all these things that just hold us back. It's so unnecessary that in the way I understand, yeah. you know, there needs to be a safe space for us to talk about this. And that's what that really was the birth of the Naturally You tour. The book is one thing; it 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 it's 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 a great you know piece of information to help you with your healthy hair journeys, to you know give you some sets of tools on understanding ingredients, your hair growth process, how often you should get your end trim, finding a stylist, all that good stuff. But the Naturally You tour is really a broader conversation about things that I feel that it's time for us to heal from. And I'm yeah. on this journey of healing. And in that process, um, Maya Vana came on board as my premier sponsor. And what's so beautiful about Maya Vana, Maya Vana is an AI and SI technology company that diagnose your hair strands and tell you exactly what products are best for you. And most people don't notice your hair, your, your hair type, your hair um, ID is just as unique as your fingerprint. And while all these products are out there that say, you know, for all hair types, that's not true. There's no product yeah. for all hair types because everybody has a different hair ID. And what my Ivana does is help you find that ID. And they, at this point, they have um, analyzed over 2 billion strands of hair. It's a huge company. 
Um, really excited to be on board. So they came on board. And the, the, the beautiful thing about the marriage is while they are helping you define your hair ID, we are helping you celebrate your hair ID and your uniqueness wow. and exactly who you are. So that's really what the Naturally You Tour is all about. You know, we launched it at Essence Fest this year. It was beautiful. Tiffany Cross moderated it. And I was the, uh, on on stage with um, Brandis Daniel, which was beautiful. The second one was in Chicago. I moderated it. My my good, dear, dear friend who I love dearly, Larry Sims, was on the panel with me. My mentor, Jacqueline Sarant, was on the panel with me. And my pastor, Rodney Patterson, was there to help kind of gives us steps in order to heal properly. And then our last one was yeah. in um, in um, New York at Curl Fest with the Curly Girl Collective. It was amazing. Tamron Hall moderated that. I was on stage. David A. Wilson was on stage who created the Griot, sold it, created it, sent it sold it again. And now he's creating a, a platform called Alter that is really for people of color to have some access to therapy, which I love that. Had um, Didi from Naturalistas. They're one of my sponsors. They created the first fashion natural hair dial, and it's amazing. So they was on stage talking about um, inclusiveness and also representation. And Candace was on stage. Candace is the CEO and creator of My Ivana, and she was on stage and gave more people a more understanding of what My Ivana has to offer. So our next one is next weekend in D.C., and I'm really excited about that. Um, I got some really special guests. I can't tell you just yet, but it's a, it's a really Don't special guest. It. And it's on the 19th <laughs> from 10 to 6 at the Eden Hotel. I'm looking forward to it. But yeah, we have, you know, Philly coming up after that. We have Atlanta. We have North Carolina. We have um, uh, Miami. We ended it at Art Basel at Miami. We have LA on the list. I'm really excited about all this, and I'm really be happy to be doing this with my Ivana. Yeah, I mean it is amazing. Um, it just <laughs> it when you hear, which is why I always love a backstory. When you hear where you started, and knowing that you were a little timid about going into this industry because you weren't really sure how you're going to be received, mm -hmm. and your your trajectory of growth and opportunities that came along and now you are empowering other people to just embrace what's there and saying whatever you're feeling don't like yeah. it's it's okay and accept and embrace this moment accept and embrace your hair like your hair is more than just some texture on top of your head like it's yeah. it's it's you and yeah. i think that people people are finally getting into a space where you're you're proud of hair, whereas hair used to be like a determining factor in so many situations. Yeah. Don't bring that nasty headed girl in my house. Like that was a thing. And yeah. now it's like, I'm gonna let it be curly. I'm gonna wash it and blow and just let it go. I'm gonna wash and set. It's now it's whatever I decide to do with my hair, that's me. That's my decision. That's my opinion. Yeah. That's what I'm gonna do. You're gonna accept it. If you don't, tuck. Yeah. And I, I love that that trajectory has just evolved so much and you're such a you're such a part of that evolving trajectory. Yeah, you know, it's just you know, as I was telling my team and Michelle knows this best, uh, my publicist, my amazing publicist, but um my marketing team, creative genius, headed up by CJ, um, you know, I just really feel like it's it's just time for us to take healing into our own hands and stop looking at any outside sources for that. So if I could be a vessel of healing uh, for people, I feel like the Naturally Youth Tour is doing the job that it's set out to do. Um, you know, yeah. I feel like I live a very free life, but I also understand what it took to get me to this place. And so if I could lend anybody that understanding, um, that wealth of knowledge, I'll be a happy camper just with the Naturally Youth Tour by itself. But what I want to do say to you is that I'm really excited about Art Basel because that's our last tour stop. And we're doing the first mm -hmm. natural hair exhibit. Um, we're doing the first natural hair exhibit um, at Art Basel. And I'm super excited about it. It's going to be uh, December the 7th through the 10th. And um, I just can't, like, I've never been to Art Basel. 
So I'm really excited that we're curating <laughs> all these, um, you know, all these artists and everything. And so it's, it's going to be cool. And just so you know, this tour is for all genders. It's not just for women. Because as I keep telling people, yeah. I even open up the conversation. This is not a conversation about hair. This is a conversation about traumas related to your hair and other traumas related to that. So it's not just, so I, I invite men, women, men are on the stage, women are on the stage. So I want everybody to experience this conversation. Which is interesting because I've, I've heard like my, my very grounded friends, um, they will say that your trauma is held in your hair. Yeah. Like your hair holds your trauma. And it's the reason why you have so many people who decide to cut their hair all the way off and start over. Yeah. And it's like, there's so much, there's so much weight that's inside of my, inside of my hair. So I have to like cut that off and let that trauma go and then start fresh. Yeah. So, and again, I know some people are going to be like, you know, that's a little extreme and I get that, <laughs> but it's like, that's how, that's how some people feel. And it's, your hair is something that has grown with you for most people, especially people that have longer hair. It's something that has grown with you. For men, it's, it's, it's the do-rag, the wave caps, the, the curl um, sponges. And guys are starting to take care of their hair a lot better because we used to wash it with whatever soap was in the bathroom. And now it's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's real when it comes to products and making sure you have accessories. Personally, I don't worry about it. <laughs> to a degree because I still have to worry about what shaving cream I'm using, what razor I'm using, how often I'm shaving my head, making sure that like there's moisturizers and aftershave. Like there's still, there's an amount of care that still goes into it because yeah. when we look good, we feel good. Yes. And I absolutely. think that's the, that's the thing. Yeah, absolutely. We always, that, that is like the name of the game. People, you know, even, even people don't want to admit it, but it's just true. It's like how you look, really decides how you feel and a lot of people need to take the power back by really taking care of themselves and this i that's why i'm you know i'm i wanted to make sure i said this for all genders and i'm not just gonna say men and women this non-binary trans whatever whoever you are come this is for you you know because there's a lot of healing that needs to go on and a lot of trauma but you know i i love that men are taking more care of themselves period and yeah. not looking at yeah. it as some feminine thing or less than masculine thing because they're taking care of themselves because they're doing a facial because they're using a scrub, all that kind of stuff. This is self-care. This is love. And take care of yeah. yourself in that way. And I, I, I just love that more men are doing that and showing it too. They're, they're expressing it, which is great. Yeah. So my last question for you, um, I feel like you're already creating your legacy. Um, people will know your name. What do you what do you want that to be like? What do you want people to know about you long term? What do you want Johnny Wright's name to mean? That I lived freely, and that's it. Outside of that, Nothing. I don't really care because I won't be here anyway. <laughs> <laughs> opposition. I don't think about any doors not being available to be open for me, even if they're closed at first. Yeah. I I don't worry about people disrespecting me. I don't worry about people being racist. I don't worry about people being, uh, have a phobia against my sexuality. I don't worry about those things. And, and because of that, I'm able to live freely. These are not thoughts that I have in my mind. And of course, this is something that I've developed over the years, but I've always been an eternal optimist. And I think because of that, it has gotten me to this place at 46 years old where I can walk through life free. And I desperately yeah. want it for anybody that I encounter. I want it for my sisters and my brothers. I want it for my whites and my blacks and my Hispanics and my Chinese and my anybody. I love everybody. I love love and I want people to live freely. And to see that their the power of their life is in their hands, but it starts with their mind first. And if you live free, you can manifest anything in your life. I love that. I absolutely <laughs> love that.